Welcome to the Sense Making in a Changing World podcast, where we explore the kind of thinking we need to navigate a positive way forward. I'm your host, Maura Gamble, permaculture educator and global ambassador, filmmaker, eco villager, food forester, mother, practivist, and all round lover of thinking, communicating, and acting regeneratively. For a long time, it's been clear to me that to shift trajectory to a thriving one planet way of life, we first need to shift our thinking. The way we perceive ourselves in relation to nature, self and community is the core. So this is true now more than ever. And even the way change is changing is changing. Unprecedented changes are happening all around us at a rapid pace. So how do we make sense of this? To know which way to turn, to know what action to focus on. So our efforts are worthwhile and nourishing and are working towards resilience, regeneration and reconnection. What better way to make sense than to join together with others in open, generative conversation? In this podcast, I'll share conversations with my friends and colleagues, people who inspire and challenge me in their ways of thinking, connecting and acting. These wonderful people are thinkers, doers, activists, scholars, writers, leaders, farmers, educators, people whose work informs permaculture and spark the imagination of of what a post-COVID, climate resilient, socially just future could look like. Their ideas and projects help us to make sense in this changing world, to compost and digest the ideas and to nurture the fertile ground for new ideas, connections and actions. Together we'll open up conversations in the world of permaculture design, regenerative thinking, community action, earth repair, eco-literacy and much more. I can't wait to share these conversations with you. Over the last three decades of personally making sense of the multiple crises we face, I always return to the practical and positive world of permaculture with its ethics of earth care, people care and fair share. I've seen firsthand how adaptable and responsive it can be in all contexts, from urban to rural, from refugee camps to suburbs. It helps people make sense of what's happening around them and to learn accessible design tools to shape their habitat positively and to contribute to cultural and ecological regeneration. This is why I've created the Permaculture Educators Program to help thousands of people to become permaculture teachers everywhere through an interactive online dual certificate of permaculture design and teaching. We sponsor global perma youth programs, women's self-help groups in the global south and teens in refugee camps. So anyway, this podcast is sponsored by the Permaculture Education Institute and our Permaculture Educators Program. If you'd like to find more about permaculture, I've created a four-part permaculture video series to explain what permaculture is and and also how you can make it your livelihood as well as your way of life. We'd love to invite you to join our wonderfully inspiring, friendly and supportive global learning community. So I welcome you to share each of these conversations and I'd also like to suggest you create a local conversation circle to explore the ideas shared in each show and discuss together how this makes sense in your local community and environment. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I meet and speak with you today, the Gubby Gubby people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. It's my absolute delight to welcome to the show today my dear friend Jonathan Dawson, who's the program lead of the Masters of Regenerative Economics at Schumacher College in Devon. This master's program challenges and offers alternative perspectives to mainstream economics and looks through the lens of ecology as if both people and the planet mattered equally. Jonathan is the former president of the Global Eco Village Network and a long-time resident of Fintorn. Jonathan has worked with small enterprise development in Africa and, and South Asia. He's the author of Guy Education's Unitar endorsed sustainable economy curriculum drawn from best practice within eco villages globally and this curriculum was adopted by UNESCO. Back in 2019 it was a delight to contribute to one of Jonathan's programs at the college called Beyond Development, a program that also included people like Kate Rayworth, Rob Hopkins, Helena Norberg Hodge, Jason Hickel and others. Jonathan has visited me here at Crystal Waters and most graciously hosted my entire family while I was teaching at Schumacher College at his Bowden house. And I can add a link below to a video that I made while I was there. One of the comments that Jonathan makes that I really like is that education is not the filling of the pail 
but a lighting of the fire. I hope you enjoyed this conversation just as much as I did. Thanks for joining me, Jonathan. It's really lovely to have you here on the show today. So for those of you who are listening, Jonathan is the program lead of the Regenerative Economics Postgraduate Program at Schumacher College. And uh, Jonathan actually came here to Crystal Waters, gosh, many years ago now, and then met again back at Findhorn and also Bowden House and Schumacher College. So it's wonderful to see you again here and thanks for joining me. I thought maybe we could start our conversation today around why is it that you've chosen economics as your way of bringing positive change in the world and the way of acting in, you know, for transition? So I think it's a really, thanks, Murai, it's lovely to be here. Um, <clears throat> this question about economics, it's a really, uh, I think it's a good place to start a conversation um, because I have to say that a, during the much of my working life, particularly the decade and a half when I was working in Africa as an economist, that when I was referred, like in a consultancy team, for example, they would refer to the economist, I'd, I'd metaphorically be looking over my shoulder and wonder who they were talking about. Because the label economist, as we recognize it in society today, doesn't feel like a good match for uh, for, for what I do. Um, so I've come to the conclusion that there are actually two quite separate disciplines with a little bit of crossover that are currently calling themselves economics, but that are really totally different subjects with different methodologies and pedagogies. So the conventional economists that you will see on mainstream media are in a paradigm that is focused on mathematics, markets, and money. So in other words, economics is a study of what passes through the markets. And because the connection, the relationship between ongoing economic growth and societal well-being is not challenged, it's assumed, it, the discipline is about how we set up our, our markets particularly in a way to enhance gross domestic product. And that's one field of study. The other field of study um, is one in which economics is a branch of moral philosophy rather than mathematics. And it does question, it goes upstream immediately to question, is there a direct relationship between ongoing economic growth and well-being? And most of the studies that ask that question come to the conclusion that at least in the industrialized world, where we are already hyper overdeveloped, that actually there tends to be an inverse relationship between the two. So we get to spend less time in relationship doing the stuff that the, the indicators, outcomes related to health, to well-being, to social functioning, tend after a certain point to be undermined by further economic growth. So the economics that I'm interested in and that we're interested in here at the college is much more economics as moral philosophy, beginning with deep questions about the nature of who are we as a species um, and <clears throat> how we can, it's a, it's a philosophical question, how we can create better societies, more just and fair and joyful, loving societies. Um, so the, the, the reason why I'm attracted to this field and most of my students are attracted to the field is that they find that economics is currently practiced is the rock on which their various dreams and schemes are foundering. And so the desire to totally, not to tweak the current system, but to really deeply question at a fundamental level, what are we talking about? What are we trying to do? And to move some of those rocks out of the path so we can actually create a, a more sympathetic, joyful society. Hmm. So what are some of the what are some of the leading thinkers or even some examples that you've seen of this different type of economic system? Like how how does it how does it play out in communities? Yes, yes. So it, I really like the way that it, it's sometimes referred to as moving from an economy based on transactions to an economy based on relationships. Mm. So at the moment, our economy is, <clears throat> I mean, recognizing again that there are many things that pass through the market that are not conducive to well-being. Wars, oil spills, chronic health problems, on and on and on and on. And there are many things that are not included in GDP that are essential to our well-being. Childcare, volunteerism, 
looking after our neighbours, elder care. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the picture that those, I think, who are really thinking about deeply questioning and transforming the nature of our economic life are really looking at moving away from quantity towards quality mm. uh, and, and really uh, looking particularly at the care, the care economy, the, the, the health-related economy, um, and, and asking questions about how we can, how can we set up our incentive structures in terms of taxation, externalities, subsidies, things like this? How can we create economic incentives that favor developing quality of relationship and slowing down? For example, I mean, the obvious examples are that, that are uppermost at the moment are things like the universal basic income and the shorter working week. So it is probable that at least in the short term, automation is going to reduce the number of jobs in the, in the system. May not be there forever, but for, for a period. So is there a way that we can share the remaining work available more fairly and equitably among the population rather than having a relatively small group of people who are stressed out because they're working so hard and then a large group of unemployed. Um, and uh, again, a universal basic income providing with, with, with the, the wealth that enables that being generated by automation, among other things, um, but then providing folk with basic security to cover their costs so they can then choose to do the work that they love rather than being forced into often meaningless, you know, what David Graeber, the, the late lamented David Graeber, a wonderful uh, US anthropologist called bullshit jobs, which is, which is where most of us are at the moment. Like again, he makes this observation that, that for a substantial proportion of the population, they get up in the morning and honestly do not believe that their work is contributing in any meaningful sense to the well-being of their community. And just considering the, the mental health of a nation, of a civilization that, that has that as a starting point at the beginning of each day. Jonathan, can you tell us more about the universal basic income? Is that, you know, I'm not sure everyone who's <laughs> listening would understand, firstly, what it is and how it would work and how that, how changing <clears throat> that is going to make or could make a difference. Yes. Yeah. So at the moment, <clears throat> we have generally in most Western industrialized countries, we have means tested welfare systems. So means tested meaning that you've got to demonstrate that you're sufficiently needy, that actually you qualify for the, for the, the payment, <clears throat> whatever the benefit is. Um, and we know already that the administrative costs of the, the costs of administering the system are huge, and they can involve also some humiliation for those who actually find themselves needing to go through the process. So the idea of a universal basic income is that through dramatically reducing the costs of the current welfare system and closing tax havens and ensuring correct, appropriate tax payments by the rich, that actually you generate a fund that's big enough to give everybody in the country unconditionally a certain basic minimum income. And ideally that income being sufficient that they, the, the beneficiaries that everybody can choose to work, but to do the work that they really want to do. Mm -hmm. Now, really first, um, the, the two big um, call-outs are hard, but there's never going to be enough money in the system to do that. And two, but then people will just be lazy and they'll sit in front of their TVs and they'll they play video games. Now, in terms of the first one, <clears throat> the first point about payment, a lot of there, there are a lot of um, um, estimates have been done, a lot of um, projections, financial projections, which actually demonstrate that that this is not does not need to be an issue. There is a way that we can fund this. On the second one, the evidence is there's been a number of studies. One very interesting one in Canada, for example, where they found that only two categories of people were, had, were choosing to work less than they'd worked before. So one was uh, mothers of young children who were able to stay at home longer with their kids. And the other was young men who were choosing to stay longer at school. So they weren't being first forced out of school by the needs to, uh, to, to 
support their families. So the evidence that given the choice, people will continue to stay engaged, but they will stay engaged in a more meaningful way doing stuff that they love. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. I wonder I wonder how that how does that apply then in, in say in places like Africa where where you were working previously? How could something like that be make a difference there? And how would it happen there? Yes. Is it possible? Um, is it possible? I mean, th- there have been experiments done in in throughout the world. I, I mean, I have to say, I'm not. I can't dive into the granularity of UBI, UBI Universal Basic Income. Um, it's not something I've studied in enormous depth. Um, but I think it might be good to begin by saying that the that that most um, radical new economy thinkers are thinking within a paradigm of degrowth, that we actually need to degrow the economy, we need to contract the economy for our own well-being and mental health. Um, However, there is similarly a recognition that in the global south, and particularly Africa, there is a need for continued economic growth for quite some time to come. Mm -hmm. So this I coined by a guy called Aubrey Mayer called Contraction and Convergence. So contraction in the north and expansion in the south to the point where there's approximate equality. So many of the many of the issues that we face in the north to which UBI, universal basic income, is I think, a really important part of the solution wouldn't apply so much in Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where the, the the task rather is to is to address systemic inequalities, power inequalities in the global system. That means, so for example, when I was working in Ghana, this is this is up at the moment in Ghana. Ghana is asking the question, this is a, a country in West Africa where I used to live, is how come we were the second largest producer in the world of cocoa? And if you look at the value of a one pound bar of chocolate, we're getting about a penny and a half. And the other 98 and a half percent of the value added goes to the north. And could we not produce the cocoa ourselves, mm-hmm. not produce the chocolate ourselves. Um, and of course, the reason they can't is that the European Union and the United States, and I guess Australia as well, but certainly the US and the European Union set their import tariffs, their import taxes at just a level where it's more profitable to do the process and the value added in Europe and the US than in Africa. And so they're left with the with the peanuts. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is one example of many uh, examples of the dice being loaded in such a way that it's pretty much impossible for Africa to escape its poverty trap. So the work that really you're doing... Oh, sorry. No, please. please I was go. just going to ask, so the work that you're doing at the college and the thinking around the type of economics we need in the world today, where how does that intersect with the, the conversations that are in the world now around decolonization? Yeah. So by decolonization, I, um, as you know, one of my, one of the threads I'm really passionate about, I mean, in fact, I see myself as being a storyteller, at least as much as being an economist. I think the two, the meeting points of economy and the arts, particularly story theater, um, I think is a really juicy, powerful place. And I think that the reason I bring this in here is the power of narratives. So, and maybe the, I can just mention at this stage that the final, the final taught module in the regenerative economics program that I lead is called Changing Frame, the Science and Art of Communication for Transition. So recognizing that we, we, we bring to the world different narratives and stories and myths and language and metaphors that condition how we experience the world. And at the moment, the, I mean, really for the last 500 years, since really the, the conquest of the Americas uh, and shortly thereafter of Australia, New Zealand, um, the dominant narrative is a Eurocentric narrative where we, I mean, even though we are now as good, modern, intelligent, progressive people, we still have this deep legacy of the superiority of the male over the female, of the white, civilized, European, Europe, Europocentric 
approach to the world, to technology, to how we engage with the world. And this is, I mean, I've been immersed in this stuff from living in Africa, traveling a lot deeply, studying anthropology. I never escape this. This is deeply in my DNA, even though I challenge it. So the decolonization is, it, the, it's, um, Decolonization of the economy then relates to challenging this core story. And again, it's something that, um, that we find a lot here at the college is this intersection as we explore the new science, new ways of thinking, we notice the parallels with indigenous wisdom traditions. So, and I, I mean, I think for you, particularly in Australia and New Zealand, um, is the opportunity here to to engage with the world and other cultures with a little more humility and be open to the possibility that there are other stories out there that could make more sense. Um, maybe just one little thing. There's, there's a, a regular uh, member of our guest faculty who has taught here at the college for many years. is a guy called David Abram. Wrote a book called Spell of the Sensuous, which is among the best books I've ever read. And he asks us to consider the truth of a people's stories by how well they enable us to live on the earth. And so by that measure, he suggests that actually our stories are deeply primitive and unhelpful. And that actually there's much wisdom to be gained from, you know, rather than being condescending towards indigenous people to, to really ask the question, are they sitting with deep narrative stories that better prepare them to live well on the planet and do we have much to learn from them it's a rhetorical question mm. so within the college then there seems to be sort of the a completely different way of teaching economics i mean it's a re, the, the name itself regenerative economics but there's something quite powerful about how it's an it's a completely immersive experience um, do you want to just maybe describe a bit about what what the Schumacher College economics mm. education looks like and how that's important in terms of yeah. like creating this new new economic story that, that that's needed in the world? Yes, indeed. Thanks. Um, so my, my first reaction is is your use of the word teach. Uh -huh. So the, <laughs> the, model, the conventional model of education is, you know, there's a wonderful WB Yeats quote that uh, education is not the filling of a pail, it is the lighting of a fire. And um, so, you know, my business card says senior lecturer in economics, and, you know, it's, it's what I do occasionally. I mean, I do enjoy standing up in front of a group and saying, I'm just going to talk for half an hour. Uh, but it's not really what I do. It's much more about creating a learning environment in which the native genius intelligence of the students can flourish. Um, I think the, the a critical bit is the, uh, the community-based nature of the education. So again, there's, a, there's a, again, a thinker recently died again called John Schotter, who distinguishes between aboutness thinking and withinness thinking. So conventionally, we're comfortable with using the intellect to analyze and to analyze out there and to have a somewhat extractive relationship in our research where we're actually going out and gathering data that we can pull back and use our intellect as a way of um, <clears throat> use our intellect to dissect and to come to wise conclusions and submit reports um <clears throat> and within this thinking is actually beginning by locating one's own subjectivity within the field. Like, what do I bring to this inquiry that brings it alive? And again, recognizing we not only we not only um, allow students to use the first person pronoun, but we actually insist on it. Among the assessed assess learning outcomes is reflexivity on your own engagement with the subjects. So, in other words, it's not a it's not a thing. The economy is not a thing out there that does things to us that are mostly pretty unpleasant, but actually it is a it is a network, a massive network of relationship in which we are deeply engaged already. So 
it's interesting that we're coming towards the end of the academic, the, the residential academic year at the moment. And the students in their reflections and feedback, I mean, they do, they do mention universal basic income and community banks and, you know, other tools out there, tools in the new economy. But really their reflections tend to be much more focused on their own personal experiences of transformation and a recognition that they are embedded in a complex system which is influencing them as they influence it. And consequently, they need to bring their subjectivity into the frame. And so it means that at the college where <clears throat> we are engaged students and staff alike in growing food, cooking food, washing dishes, um, it means that the, the membrane that would separate the learning space from the other space is pretty much abolished. The kind of education or the learning that takes place there, that the people who come through Schumacher College go out into the world and take this transformative experience. And where, where do they go and how do they then, have you heard stories back about how they begin to shape uh, organisations or, or communities that they're in, in a way that is helping this transition? Yes. So on the Schumacher College Regenerative Economics webpage, we do have a tab called uh, Alumni Profiles. So I direct anyone who's interested in this particular to go there. Um, <clears throat> all sorts. Um, it's definitely a, <clears throat> a challenge. I noticed a little bit of a pattern that people leave after a year here, year here, having in most cases had a deeply transformative experience and spending the next months or maybe even year toying with this question of how do I take this stuff, which is deeply challenging the core assumptions and norms and behaviors and institutions and the dominant system currently, how do I take this and apply this in a way that will be satisfying to me and will, will contribute to the greater good? Um, so like some examples are, I don't think that any student, we've been running the program for 10 years, or we've been running an economics master's program for 10 years. And um, I don't think any student came with the law on the radar, but it definitely has emerged as being a potentially powerful leverage point. Mm -hmm. so, so like around the world at the minute, the, the courts are filled with cases of um, governments being taken to court by their own citizens, often in the name of other species or future generations, in terms of um, <clears throat> in terms of their response to climate change and biodiversity loss, um, and I, I, in, in New Zealand particularly, the the advance of ecocide and 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 legal suits. Um, to give rivers, for example, or mountain ranges rights um, or challenges to exploitative platform corporate platform um, the, the great uh, tech giants Uber and Airbnb, for example, who are making much of their money by denying their workers uh, holiday pay and and, and other worker rights because they call them associates. So there's tons of really interesting stuff happening in the law. Um, education is another field. It's clearly a place that people could, would be attracted to who are interested in enabling deep transformation of consciousness. Some people create their own social enterprises. Uh, there's a guy um, <clears throat> who was here a few years back who was fascinated by community woodlands from the beginning. And he's now created just out the back of the college a wonderful um, social enterprise that is based on using the woods as a as a as a, um, uh, a base for education and environmental awareness raising. Um, NGOs, um, think tanks, mm -hmm. um, lots of really interesting. Um, I mean, it's it's a very impressive. If you look at it, if you again, if you look at our student uh, alumni stories on the web page. Um, it's a very, it's a very happy set of stories. Uh, one, one is uh, just one more is that uh, some of your 
you, your your um, audience may have heard of Donut Economics. Mm-hmm. This is a woman called Kate Rayworth who has created a really fascinating new way of exploring the world and how we can do it better. And she has recently created a team called the Donut Economics Action Lab. And she's got two employees, both of whom have been through this program. Uh-huh. Wonderful. Yeah. Yep. I, we um we explore that too through the through the permaculture <clears throat> educators program that I run. Yeah, That's course. part of what we, we explore too. And I wonder where in what you're describing that you see things like the sharing economy or like the community sharing economy or gift economy, where that plays a part in in the Mm -hmm. conversations that you have. Yeah. So the gift economy is is strong anyway because it's basically who we are as a species. Like we are a gift-giving species. Um, one of the real gifts, I mentioned David Graeber before, <clears throat> recently deceased, unfortunately. Um, but one of the, uh, he was a great, <clears throat> a great myth buster, like really deeply challenging the core mythology underlying what we assume to be normal. And this one, I really enjoy this, um, this one little um, piece that he brings to the puzzle where he He's saying, okay, so the dominant story we have is that, and this goes to Adam Smith and beyond, is that we are fundamentally, we like transactions and money. And and so the the, the root of money was the inefficiency of barter. So as long as there's only two items in the the economy, there's little bearskins and clubs, then you can swap one for the other. And that's your change. But as soon as you begin to get other things into the into your economy you know that doesn't work because what happens if you've i want what you've got but you don't want what i've got so and that's what money came from, comes from yeah and you kind of recognize that as being our societal story and he as an anthropologist he then says no society has ever been found anywhere where that was the case that's how money came into operation anywhere that actually the way the transaction happened was through the medium of gifts. Mm-hmm. So the the again he asked us to imagine a hunter going into the forest and making a kill and coming back. And according to the dominant story today, he would have set up a, a stall in the market and and sold to those who could afford and and not to those who couldn't. He said, no, that's total nonsense. The way it happened is that he would come back from the forest and he'd give it away. Um prioritizing pregnant women and children and the elderly. And the reason he did this, of course, is that in a society without a welfare state, you know, your best survival strategy is to develop a reputation for generosity. And so our deep, deep, deep root is gift giving. So this is, it's it's, it's it's almost an irrepressible urge in this to give a gift. Again, I just invite you to, to reflect on the difference between a cash transaction and a gift having been given. It's a totally different experience. Mm-hmm. However, our current economic system expands by pulling things that have been in the gift economy into the monetary economy so you can grow GDP, gross domestic product. So this is a this is a core motive force within the capitalist system. So how do we, your question, our question is, how can we transition more from an economy based on transition to an economy based on relationship? And it's a tricky one. And I have to say that my own personal theory of change is kind of based on crisis, just inherent crises in the current system. So do I see us being able to make a transition in a way that favors relationship over transaction in the absence of deep systemic crisis? I don't. So if we look at the moment, for example, what's happening with the pandemic, <clears throat> the pandemic on the one hand and climate change on the other, um, you know, we, we have a government in the United Kingdom at the moment that is probably as right wing as any we've ever had. And they're enacting policies that were a socialist government to have enacted them, they would be howled at. 
you know, the government is intervening to make massive payments to support people who are unemployed, to bring the homeless back into 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 uh, proper accommodation. Um, and the government is spending trillions in support because it doesn't have a choice. Because you know, if if the government's role the government's role is becoming rather than enabling the extraction of ma- massive profits for corporations to looking after the people. And these crises will only intensify both the, the, the costs associated with responses to climate change and <clears throat> the, the evidence suggests that this pandemic will, is the first of a, a wave of pandemics that is likely to come because the source of the pandemic is um, our incursion into the, into the ecosystems of other species, wild species that we haven't yet been coming into contact. So in this context of crisis, a growing proportion of government resources will have to be devoted to the care economy, to protecting the people and responding to climate change, either mitigation or adaptation. So in this context, again, I've just read this wonderful book by a guy called Tim Jackson. He most famously, he wrote a book called Prosperity Without Growth. And his new book is called, I Think Beyond Growth, um, something like that. And he is painting a very plausible scenario that actually the foundations of capitalism are actually crumbling right at the moment. And they're crumbling because the government is being pulled in, in a way that it's tried to step back to enable corporations to take over, that the state is necessarily being pulled in with its resources devoted to the care economy, because not out of any ideological conviction, but because it doesn't have a choice. The moment I see enormous potential and lots of new niches opening up, but they're not opening up because of ideological conviction within the society more broadly. They're opening up because the nature of the crises converging in the civilization are so great that, you know, times of crisis open up massive. Uh, I mean, as you and I know, there's a proliferation of really interesting community-based initiatives happening at the moment. It's happening because of the major crises like between unemployment, the massive and growing gap between the rich and the poor, ecological dislocation, pandemics. So this is a context in which business as usual, profit-driven business as usual, I think, it seems to me, just cannot survive. Mm. And as that happens, then the native genius of the people is, is being is manifest in, in all of the different activities that you and I are engaged in. I, I want to, again, refer to Paul Hawkins' Blessed Unrest. This is a book that came out maybe a decade or so ago, where he described the outpouring of um, NGOs, community groups. I mean, he lists them. There's tens of thousands of them. And he describes, he, he asked, gleefully, he asked the question, could this be the Earth's immune system kicking in? And again, a beautiful metaphor. And I think that's what's happening. Um, but it's happening not because we have won the ideological of the power battle with capitalism, but rather because we just don't have a choice. So do you feel, I mean, I know this is a fraught question, but do you feel hopeful then when you see this, that that, that we, we do have the capacity, we mm. do have it inherently within us to make the changes that we need to make? Are we going to make them fast enough? Are we... Are we, are we, mm-hmm. what well, else the, do you think we could be doing towards this from your perspective? The question is, is are we doing it fast enough for what? Mm. Like, are, are we, there's massive suffering and dislocation already in the system, mostly manifest in the global south, but like Australia is getting its own, its own share of it um, over the last couple of years. Um, <clears throat> and like already, built into the system is massive dislocation and suffering. Um, like I'm thinking particularly of the, like what we've seen so far in terms of migrants coming into North America and Europe, like we're just beginning to touch the, this is just the the first signs of a much more serious longer term problem. <clears throat> um, so am I confident that we can make a transition? I 
I feel confident that we have got that we have got the um, the native intelligence and um, the, the the lineage our, our lineage is a gift giving species whose success is based on its capacity for generosity outside of the gene pool sets us up beautifully for responding well to a cataclysmic crisis so will we make a will we make a transition i think we will live skillfully through a transition that will be enforced upon us um and we are a meaning making species <clears throat> and at the moment not much makes sense which i think is being translated into serious epidemics of of substance abuse and and depression and suicide and my reading of history is that in times where a generation is given a mission and feels a power of mission to achieve that what we're capable of is astonishing mm. And I think the invitation as well is to be here now, not to become too obsessed and fixated with, like noticing that that our capacity for worry is significantly greater than often the the thing itself. So I think our, our, the, the invitation is to become much more grounded in appreciation, celebration of what we have at the moment, and to reawaken to ourselves and each other and to our mission as a generation. That, that to me sounds like a beautiful way to close this conversation, Jonathan, because that that invitation is is something that I think calls to to so many people in in so many parts of the world. Yeah. So thank you so much for taking the time today to, to well, talk. Thank you. It's been lovely to be in conversation. Mm. I'm going to share. So any all the listeners who are here, I. I'm going to share all the different links that you've mentioned, different books and um, links to the college uh, down in the show notes. And if there's anything else that you wanted to, to share as well, Jonathan, maybe about um, how people can get in touch with, with the college, for example, is there, how do they connect with, with your <laughs> master's program, for example? What's that process look like? So a web search in Schumacher College. <clears throat> we'll take you directly there. Um, and <clears throat> I can be contacted via the website. So if anybody wanted, whether it's a conversation about the course or just a more generalized chat, um, I'm totally open to that. Fantastic. And uh, when when is your when does the year of your masters begin? When does that all start? Uh, Mid September. Mid September. Okay. So we have we have um, <clears throat> we have four six week modules: ecology and economy. Always beginning with ecology. Economics is a subsystem of, of economic of, of economics is a subsystem of ecology, not vice versa. Um, beyond growth, regenerative enterprise, and changing the frame. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's been such a pleasure to have you with you today. As all, right. Thank you. So that's all for today. Thanks so much for joining us. Head on over to my YouTube channel, the link's below, and then you'll be able to watch this conversation. But also make sure that you subscribe because that way you'll be notified of all new films that come out. And also you'll get notified of all the new all the new interviews and conversations that come out. So thanks again for joining us. Have a great week and I'll see you next time.